Listen, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to my favorite psalm, probably your favorite psalm too, if we're to be honest. Uh, I, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say it this way, I don't know, but you guys know me, I'm at home, is that all right? I can just kind of be me, you know. Um, I don't necessarily have something super complicated to give you today. I hope that's all right. I mean, I, I, this is one of those weeks where the Lord kind of just burned a scripture in my heart. And so I'm just going to go through it with you because I think it's something we need to know. I think it's time for us to be ready. Amen? Amen. And that's what I want to talk to you about. And I'll kind of share because y'all know I'm a little different. So the Lord speaks to me in ways that He probably don't speak to you. He uses some things that doesn't even really make sense, but there He uses them to speak to me. Is that all right? Let me sort of tell you when the Lord started dealing with me about what to talk about here tonight. It was uh, last Friday. I went to work. Uh, if you don't know, I teach at a college uh, at East Central. Uh, there, I, I say that because I've been there a little while, and there's still people that still ask me, and sometimes I don't know. So, I mean, not that it's that important, but, you know, I teach at a college now. So, Fridays are kind of days I like because we don't have class. I just get to go sit in my office and kind of grade, and introverts like me, I just get to sit in my office. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you know, sometimes you can, that sounds, but sometimes I just like sitting in the, anyway, we won't go there, but it's usually the mornings I just get to kind of sit back and do what I need to do, and you know, I've got some co-workers that we go and eat lunch together on those days, because we're all kind of free at lunch, so that, that gets my extrovert going, that gets me on that side, but I have a few hours just to sit, and so last Friday, we had what's called configation, we were going to have to have meetings, so they were, was already uh, these three 20-minute sessions I was going to have to go sit in so they could give us information. Does that make sense? Well, they had an hour session before. At, those started at like 9.30. and 8.30, they had this session. They had already emailed it out, and it was in big letters, Retirement Planning. So y'all know what I did. I was like, uh, I'm skipping that. I mean, you know, I've got things I need to do. I like a long time in my office. I mean, I'll be honest, I'm probably a little older than I look. Believe it or not, I only have 11 years, but there's still 11 years until I'm even eligible for any of that. I'm not going to waste my Friday morning by myself to go listen to that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm like, shh. Now, granted, the way the Lord has placed me and the way He has a sense of humor and the way that He grows me, most of my peers... Probably could have retired 11 years ago, to be honest. I mean, I ain't be, you know, I'm on the hall with a lot of people who are in that age group. They're in that bracket where that's prime information. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And so I'm sitting there just minding my own business, trying not to make eye contact because our offices have these big windows and you can see what everybody's doing in the hallway. So if I don't make eye contact, I can just you know sit at my computer and do what I want to do. And our department chair, bless her heart, who taught me there at East Central 20 years ago and is still kicking. Just in that last moment, she comes by and says, you coming? And you have to understand, she did it with that authoritative voice where there was no way I could really say no. Y'all know what I mean? And so all the internal conflicts going on, I'm not anywhere near this. I'm going to go waste my time. I'm going to lose my mind. I'm not going to be able to grade the papers this morning I needed to. I'm going to have to do it another time. <gasps> so I sort of, but I'm going to be a team player. I sucked it up and all of our hallway peers all went in there and they were real excited because again, this is kind of, but believe it or not, I sat there and I listened to all that and I, and at the end of it, you know what happened? I was like, you know what? They actually talked about some stuff that I could do right now that I probably need to do right now in preparation for what's to come. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Now listen, y'all may think, well, that's silly, that's great. That may not be real prophetic to you. But in that moment, the Holy Spirit started talking to me, okay? Not only just about retirement stuff and financial planning for what may come in 11 to 15 years, he started talking to me and really the last several nights, even, you know, as I've been awakened from sleep, from dreams or from the, the Lord's sort of been telling me that we as the body of Christ have got to prepare. We've got to be ready. And I know we like to, you know, the old, we, even pastor loves to talk about the old TDJs, get ready, get ready, get ready. You know, we, we love to talk about it and get Pentecostal about it and get excited about it. I mean, if I were to sit here and for the next hour start saying, get ready for your blessing, son, we'd have a great night. And listen, don't get me wrong. I believe there's blessings and favor that God has for you that you need to prepare yourself for. Amen? Amen. Don't take me wrong. I'm not saying... But there's also going to be some battles and some struggles and there's going to be some, some things that should the Lord tarry that all of us in here, not being negative, being real, may be facing in the next 
seasons of our life. Is this okay? And so what do we need to do? We need to be ready. We kind of want to treat it like I was wanting to treat that retirement stuff. Man, it ain't, it ain't here yet, so I'm not going to worry about it. But then when you get in a battle, if you're not ready for it, guess what? You're not going to do well. So as the Lord started talking to me, he reminded me of this psalm that you may have heard hundreds of times preached. But I just really feel like if we walk through this, it's going to show us how to be ready for whatever's to come in our life. Is this okay? So go with me to Psalm chapter 91. Psalm chapter 91. What I want us to do is I'm going to teach, maybe even get excited and preach a little bit. We're going to go through Psalm 91. We're going to talk about it. And then I want us to practice at the end praying through Psalm 91 because there's some needs in this house. There's some needs connected to our house that I feel that we need to touch God for. Is that okay? So that's where we're going tonight, all right? Chapter 1 or verse 1 of Psalm 91. You could probably quote it. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the... Let's pause right there. He who what? Man, that is so powerful. Now let me stop right here, I'll, and then we'll get into it. This psalm is powerful because it actually tells us two actions that we need to take. Everybody say two. two. Now can we, again, I guess because I was talking about retirement, now investment on my mind. Let's talk investment. If I told everybody in here that for every $2 you paid me, I could give you $20 back, how many of you would be emptying out your account to get involved in that? Yeah, that's pretty good return, isn't it? Well, listen, never don't don't get miss what I'm about to say. I don't believe the Lord is asking us to buy blessings, but He does give us two commands. If we do two things right here in the beginning, that if we do those two things, there's about twenty or so promises in the rest of this chapter that He's about to give us. I don't know about you. I'm not an investor, but that's a pretty good investment based on what I what I can understand about it. Amen. So this is the first one. He who dwells. Now that's important. I could pause here and preach a long time. I don't have a long time, so we got a lot to cover, but I'm going to stop right here. Dwells. Inhabits. Sits down with. Y'all understand what I'm saying? How many of you felt the Holy Spirit? Or you, even maybe I still feel the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you. The Holy Spirit came and inhabited this place. That's what the Bible says that He will do. His presence inhabits or dwells with the praises of His people. Why did we just spend time doing it? We were worshiping Him. We were giving Him honor. We were telling God that He's holy and we were respecting who He is. Is that good? Well, guess what? When we do that, not only does His presence dwell with us, but we begin to dwell with Him. We begin to spend time with Him. He who decides to dwell in the secret place, the Holy of Holies. I know I preach about this a lot, but I'll say it again. This psalm was actually written by Moses. Maybe I got ahead of myself, but if you didn't know, a lot of psalms are by David. This is not a psalm of David. Most scholars believe this was written by Moses. Psalm 90 and then 91 was written by Moses near the beginning of their 40-year trek in the wilderness. They're getting ready to go to the promised land. They're about to be on a long journey because of some of their stubbornness. They're about to face a lot of enemies. Does this make sense? So Moses, as their leader, he decides, I need to make sure you guys understand that though things get tough, you still have an incredible God. So this is what you need to do. You need to dwell in the secret place, the holy place. Now, obviously, at that time in the Old Testament, the holy place was the holy of holies, and there was only a select few that could go in. But I'm here to tell you, we're in the New Testament dispensation, amen? How many of you are glad that Jesus came and when he died, the veil was torn? That means no longer do I have to have someone go in for me. I don't have to have Pastor Light go in for me. He can pray for me and that's powerful. But I can go before the throne of grace myself to the holy place where his presence dwells and I get to experience that myself. And that's Wednesday night. I'm supposed to be calm. I'm sorry. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. If you decide to stay there, here's the problem we have. Are you ready? We're a culture that likes to experience it for a little bit, but then go back to where we were. We're a culture that wants to be able to fulfill our duties of coming to church two and a half times a month. And that alone is supposed to be getting us through. We, we, we live our lives fulfilling the flesh and the dreams of the flesh and the American dream and everything that the world tells us that we need to do. And we spend so much time being busy trying to build kingdoms and trying to do what 
culture has told us is what's right. I'm here to tell you the Lord is looking for someone who's willing to dwell in the secret place, not just visit. Listen, these worship experiences aren't a vacation that are supposed to refresh you to go back and live your life in a mundane manner. This is supposed to be your life. This is supposed to be the lifestyle that you're living, a lifestyle of God's presence where I wake up every single morning and I say, God, I can't start this day if I don't spend a little bit of time with you. If I don't hear your voice speak to me and tell me and remind me that I'm your son. If I don't hear your voice reminding me that everything's going to be okay. I want to dwell in the secret place. When you, he who dwells in the secret place will do what? He gives a promise right away. Shall abide under the shadow. El Shaddai. The shadow of the Almighty. So he's saying if you will dwell in the secret place, guess what? You're under my shadow. You're under my influence. You're under my power. How powerful is that shadow? Well, I mean, the very... Look at, look at what Moses experienced later on in Exodus, if you can allow me just to kind of paraphrase. Is this okay? Moses wanted to see the face of God, and God said, you can't see my face, you die. He says, but at the very least, I'm going to let you just see a, a glimpse. And, and the story is, as Moses had to go hide in a cave, and he trembled, and he barely could see just the very bit of the coattail of God as his glory went by. How powerful is that? That's the shadow I'm under. That same power that Moses experienced is with me every single day that I live. So why should I fear and tremble? Oh, I'm getting excited and getting ahead of myself. But why would I fear and I tremble the little things that we face here on this earth when I've got that much power within me? Oh, my goodness. Look at the next thing. Here's the second thing. Verse 2. You have to dwell, but then notice what it says. I will say of the Lord. Everybody say, say. All right, you, you notice how you did that. You just opened your mouth and words came out, right? Do that again. Say. Say. All right. So not only do you have to dwell, you have to reach a place where you are willing to be in the presence of God, in the secret place, but then you have to open your mouth and proclaim. The Bible over and over again says that life and death are in the power of what? Again, we're not trying to get prosperity preacher here and, and, and into the name, it, but, but there's power in what you say. You keep glorifying your problems, your problems will receive glory and get bigger. But you glorify your God, you open up the possibilities of Him becoming big in your life. Is this okay? I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. In my God, I will... So right away... Two things in these first two verses that Moses, the psalmist here, is telling us, and they apply to us just as they do the Israelites. If you will make the presence of God a lifestyle, you understand? If you will dwell there, if you will make sure that it's not just something you experience when we sing a few slow songs in a service, it's not just something that you experience when the preacher's just right and it's your favorite preacher. You understand what I'm saying? When it becomes a lifestyle and something you experience every single part of your day, and then along with that experience, you begin to speak and talk about how great your God is, that opens up and unlocks His hand to start to move in your life. And so, from here on, now we're going to get excited because now He's going to tell us what happens when we start dwelling and we start saying. Are you all with me? He says this in verse 3, Surely... He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Everybody glad that you can be delivered today? That's a promise. If you begin to go and seek the secret place, and you begin to talk about how good God is, and you begin to proclaim with your mouth who He is, then guess what? Everything the enemy tries to snare you with, or trap you with, or try to get a hold of you with, it has no power. You've already had a promise of God that He will deliver you. What kind of things is the enemy trying to snare you with? Well, that means that the next time that that image pops up on your screen and makes your mind want to go in a certain place, oh, that's a trap. But I've been in the secret place today and I've already talked about my God. So my God will come and provide a way of escape to ensure that I don't fall back into that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The next time I'm walking along and I'm tempted to go have a drink, even though I've been delivered from it for a long time, listen, I've been in the secret place. The Lord will provide a way of escape. The next time that negative person comes to you and starts trying to gossip and run down everything and you're tempted to get right there in the mud with them and run down a bunch of people, guess what? The Lord will give a way of escape and He'll remind you, wait, this isn't who you are. 
This isn't the kind of preaching we like because I think a lot of times we, even in the church, we, this, y'all don't think I'm sounding crazy. Maybe I am, but I'll explain. I think sometimes we like the traps <laughs> because I think sometimes the traps give us excuses. I, I know that's ain't going to be popular. I better just get back to the exciting stuff. But I think sometimes we, 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 we like to leave ourselves a little room. That's why you have the movement in the church. Hey, man, you just, everybody love everybody. Grace, you just do what you want to do. Everybody be happy. There comes a point if we're going to walk in the kingdom that we, we should be walking above where we're not being trapped every day of our life. Now, listen, I've told you before. You know, so if you've heard me, I'll tell it again in case you hadn't heard me. Listen, there, I'm not saying we ever reach a point where we're above temptation or we're above falling. Do you understand what I mean by that? I don't want to be or ever come across that arrogant. There's no, you know, there, I'm, I'm susceptible. That's why I have to dwell every single day. Does this make sense? All right. So surely he's going to deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And listen to this, from the perilous pestilence. Man, just the sickness of sin. You ever look at the world and it just seems like the world, we talk about the world's going mind, mad. They're just, there's people that are sick in the head. Y'all quit looking around. I ain't talking about anybody in here. I'm talking about the world. I'm talking about people who are out there. I'm talking about people who are crazy enough who like to, you know, let kids try to convince them that, hey, you're a kid, but you know what? You're a boy. You can be a girl if you want to. That's sick. We've convinced people to use, you use whatever bathroom you want to. Man, that's crazy. We're even to the point where, hey, you want to be a cat and use a litter box? Do that. I mean, we're, we're sick. But guess what? If I, if I dwell in the secret place of the Almighty and I begin to profess that God is God and I make Him the Lord of my life, the Lord says that He protects our mind. If you wonder why there's that sickness, there's people who haven't got into that secret place, so their mind's susceptible to all these attacks of the enemy. I'm thankful that the Lord has given us a mind. Amen. He's given us a clear mind that we can see things in the way that He wants to. Is this okay? Let's move to verse 4. He shall cover you with His feathers. Now listen, they're not literally going to be feathers falling down. So I don't, you know, I know some churches like to worship real, you know, out there. I'm not saying you need to bring feather wings and we wave them next Sunday. Okay. This is symbolic. It's symbolic of an eagle, of a mother bird that, that puts her young underneath that big wing. When the wind blows and it gets harsh, those baby birds, they're protected. The sun gets harsh, they're protected. The rain starts coming down, they're protected. I don't know about you, but I've been in seasons where there's been storms and it felt like everything in life was coming at me full force. Anybody been there before? But I am so thankful that I didn't have to face it alone. I'm thankful that when I got into the secret place, my father put his feathers on me. And there were things that would have taken me out, but God, hallelujah. I'm glad that I'm here and I'm able to stand and continue moving because of the protective power of the Father. Under his wings you shall take refuge, and truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Look at the language there. The shield and the buckler is what take, took care of the whole armor. It sort of brought everything together. It protected the most susceptible parts. Soldiers in the time had to make sure that that, that buckler was, was buckled because that was the place where in battle and hand-to-hand combat, people would stab. Aren't you glad that when the enemy tries to bring attacks against you and people try to bring you down and haters try to hate? Anybody know what I'm talking about? When people try to steal your joy and rain on your parade and people try to hate on you saying you're just a Jesus freak or all, oh, you're just excited, you just don't, you're just out. No, they're trying to stab you with those things to bring you down. But my God says, I'm going to give you a protection. It's like a discount double check that's right there that no matter what the enemy brings, you're going to be protected. Amen? Move on to the next verse. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. That's powerful. Anybody ever have nightmares before? Maybe two parts here, literally. One of the few places the enemy can attack you is in your mind. And so that's why there are times, even when you're asleep, that your mind becomes susceptible to attacks of the enemy. There are times when you dream something, it isn't always the Taco Bell or the pizza that you ate before. Sometimes it is. 
Sometimes it's the Lord speaking to you. I've had prophetic dreams. But then there are times when I know that it's the enemy trying to strike fear. I usually know it the moment I wake up. Even in the last few weeks, I'll, if I'd be just transparent, nothing super specific, but there have been times where I've had dreams and I've woken up and that feeling was there. That feeling of fear over something happening. Something happening to my home or my family. or something. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And what the enemy wants to do is start planting those seeds in your mind so that then you begin to dwell on them. There's that word again. You begin to dwell on those. Does this make sense? You begin to think about, oh no, what if this happens? Oh no, what if that happens? Oh no, what if I'm not ready? Oh no, what if I'm not prepared? Oh no, what if this, this happens? Am I, am I going to be able to overcome it? But I'm thankful that if you will dwell on the Lord, even in the moments when He tries to send those things, you know what all I had to do is wake up and in that moment where my heart's beating fast and I may be even in a sweat and I start to want to panic and think about those things, all I have to do is say the name of Jesus. All I have to do is proclaim the name of Jesus and begin to rest one more time in the secret place. And guess what happens? The Lord delivers me from those terrors. Amen? Some of you, it may not be a literal night terror, but there may be a fear or anxiety that continues to come to your mind. It may be a fear that your family's going to be hurt. It may be a fear that at some point your job, you're just going to lose it. It's just all going to be over. Sometimes, I mean, it's natural. As a man, I'll be honest, sometimes there's a fear that something may happen and I can't provide. And what the enemy simply wants you to do is get those thoughts implanted, one good in your mind that you just dwell on it, enough that you begin to take your focus off of God and you start to give glory to a problem. Is anybody with me today? I'm here to tell you there's a promise. You don't have to be afraid of those terrors by night. You don't have to be afraid of the arrows that fly by day. You don't have to leave your house every day worried about what's going to happen today. I'm not telling you every day is going to be great and wondrous, and if you have hardships, that, that's not what I'm saying at all. You may still have hardships, but here's what I've learned. Even when the tires are flat and all the dryers break and it seems like everything, it's the worst day in the world, God's still God, and I'm still okay. And I've learned that even in those moments, the Lord will provide when I need it. I hope this makes sense. I may be getting too excited to it. I don't know. Let's move on. Next verse, verse 6. Nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness. Listen, I, and I always am careful when I say this, but I think it's very important. Man, we get in seasons like this, and I know that there's people who deal with illness, and there's people who deal with sickness. Uh, all of us, we're, we're human flesh. Do we realize that? There are certain things because we're imperfect human flesh because of the fall, our bodies are eventually going to have to deal with Listen, until the Lord comes back, with the exception of a few stories in the Bible, the mortality rate's about 100%. <laughs> Y'all understand what I mean by that? There's a good chance every single one of us in here, if the Lord tarries, will die. So I say all that to say there's some people, though, who just constantly live in fear of, of what if I get an illness, or what if this happens, or what if that happens. Listen, we've come through a few years of the, the world with people trying to strike this fear into our mind of what if something happens. Does this make sense? But I've got a promise in the Word, though. It doesn't matter what it is, what, what mutation of it is, what's going around. I'm not telling you I will never be sick, but I'm here to tell you I will be healed. I'm here to tell you that healing's a part of, part of my, 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 my salvation. It was paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? I don't have to wake up wondering when I'm going to get sick. I want, I'm saying when I'm going to be healed. You don't have to be afraid of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays at waste at noonday. Man, I know, we, you, anybody just watch the news and you have, it makes you feel bad? Anybody ever do that? I mean, I really do try to watch the news for a little bit each week. Just because I do, I mean, just my personality. I feel like I need to know what's going on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But I promise you, it usually is about 10 or 15 minutes. That's about all I can take until the next week. Because at some point, somebody's going to start arguing about something. And somebody's going to try to convince me, you know, this side's going to convince me that the people on the left are going to destroy the world if nothing changes in the next month. And then this channel is going to tell me the people on the right are destroying the country and it's going to all end. And the people in the middle are blaming both the left and the right and it's all going to end. Y'all know what I mean? It's like everything you look at is like some sort of apocalypse scenario. But I'm here to tell you, the world may, may crumble and fall. The economy can crumble and fall. 
I'm not speaking those things. Some people get real prophetic and say, no, I'm not speaking those things, but let's say if those things happen. The economy crashes. Let's say the world, our political system goes into chaos. It never will change the fact that God is still God and God will still be on the throne and I will still be under His wing. not saying that things will be perfect we may you know there are brothers and sisters we have that right now have to meet underground because they will be killed dead if they're caught proclaiming Jesus in public but guess what they're still under the shadow of the almighty the Lord still has them protected that's what we need to understand look at the next verse a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand but it shall not come near you are y'all getting that promise right there? Now listen, sometimes we read and we talk about this. I know if, you, if your heart's not right, it can, again, I've been careful to say, it. I'm not going to sound arrogant and like I'm better than anybody. Does that make sense? Hopefully anybody that knows me, that's the, I, I, if I detest any trait, that's the <laughs> trait I detest. I, I'm, I'm no greater than anyone in here, okay? But I think sometimes the enemy has us convinced that if we start talking like this, hey, if a thousand faults, you're right, but God still has you, that means we're being arrogant with our faith. That's not what we're saying. It's just a trust in knowing that if I'm doing what I'm supposed to and I'm in God's hand, then He's got me. He's big enough to decide whether or not I'm going to move forward, and He's promised that I would. He's promised that I'm going to achieve everything that He has for me. Again, as long as I have made my priorities right and I'm dwelling with Him, and as long as I am proclaiming that He is God and made Him the Lord of my life, then everybody else in the world can go broke and hungry. The Lord's going to provide for me. It may be with a bird bringing me food, but He's going to provide for me. Is this okay? It may just be a pack of ramen noodles that ends up falling out of the sky somewhere, but God's going to provide for me. Look at the next verse. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. So many times the enemy wants to let you think, man, you're just missing out. I know all the time I've taught with students, when I was young, that was always the big fear. Man, I'm, I was blessed. The Lord protected me. I, I'm not saying I was always perfect. I had my own problems, my own issues the Lord had to deal with. But I grew up in the church and, and grew up near the faith. I didn't go out and do all this crazy stuff that a lot of people did. And so what did the enemy mess with me? Look at you. You were a sinner anyway because you had your own problems. You might as well lived it up and see what you missed out on with all these other people. And if we're not careful, all of us, the enemy, in our quiet times, in our alone times, will try to start, look at what you're missing out on. It starts with a lifestyle of sin. You decide that I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to party, I'm going to save myself for marriage. The Lord will say, look at what all you missed out on. Or not the Lord, the enemy. The enemy will say, look at what all you missed out on. But I'm here to tell you, there's nothing the enemy could have offered me that compared to what the Lord has done for me. Amen? But it doesn't stop from there. Once you get to a place of maturity where you're past that moment, then you get to a place where, you know, you may be a a, a person who's devoted to the church. Man, you're at church Sunday, you're at church Wednesday, you're at church, uh, you, you serve, you teach, you put a lot of time and effort into the kingdom. Don't think the enemy's gonna be silent just because you're doing all that stuff, is he? Man, look at you doing all that stuff. Wouldn't it be nice if you just took off every once in a while? You know, I've joked around. Y'all have heard me say it. I'll say it again. <laughs> there have been certain, not every Sunday, don't start thinking that, but there have been a few Sundays I've driven by the golf course on the way here to church for music practice about 6.45, and I was like, man! Man, I could go up here and play some music and shake hands with everybody and smile and do all the things that I need to do, but man, it would just be nice to just be able to go out there and not think about anything for And if we're to be honest, there's some of you who've had those thoughts before too, right? (laughs) Maybe not the golf course, man. I see people who, you know, during football season, they travel around and go go see their team play seven times a season, man. They go all over the place. Just take whole weekends. And I'm not saying that's wrong and I'm not hating on them. Please make sure that's understood. But sometimes when I look at the things that God has called me to and, and I say, man, 
the Lord won't let me to do that. God, why, why not? It must be nice. And the enemy will use that just like he tempted Jesus using some of these same scriptures in this chapter. He showed Jesus, look at this. I can give you all of these things. And sometimes, if we're honest, those things are presented to us. Man, it'd be nice just to not have any obligation. How many of you have ever said that before? If you hadn't, it's because you may not have any obligation. But you start, you get into a, to a lifestyle of commitment and working multiple jobs and having multiple things. You'll understand that there's a thing called obligation. And you go to retirement meetings so you can hear and dream about when there's no more obligation. Okay. And so what will the enemy do? Is, am I making sense? I'm not trying to just be silly or funny. I'm making sense. The enemy will try to put these things ahead. I'm not saying retirement's the enemy. I'm saying he'll try to tempt you to give up on an obligation and try to show you that, oh, you don't have to be all that. You don't have to do all those things they're doing. And try to get you away from you doing exactly what God has called and destined and designed you to do. Does this make sense? But the Lord is saying that, listen, if you'll stay in the secret place, when I start having those thoughts and I want to get into the mully grubs and pity parties, again, none of y'all do that. Y'all are spiritual. But when I get in those moments when I want to vent to God and say, God, it's not fair. I do this all the time. And I, uh, they get to do that, God. Why don't we get it? Then I get into the secret place and He begins to speak. And I feel His hand reach down and touch me and remind me, I didn't call you to be like everybody else. I designed you specifically to do those things that you're doing right now. And though you may think in the moment the enemy may be trying to tell you there's more joy there, you would just end up unhappy and you would end up in a worse place than you are right now. So why don't you just let me strengthen you? Why don't you just let me encourage you? And why don't you just look at the blessings that I have for you because of you fulfilling the role I've called you to do? Is this okay? Only the eyes will look and see the reward of the wicked. It may look like their reward, but we're going to know in the end we're the ones that are going to win. Amen? And regardless of the reward that may be great here on this earth, none of it pales in comparison to the reward that we're going to be promised one day in heaven. If there's a, a land where the streets are literally made of gold and we're going to have rooms in a mansion, listen, it's got to be much greater than anything I could fathom here on this earth. Look at the next verse. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Again, He's reminded you, because you've done this, because you've dwelled and you've made it the Most High place, you've made it the desire of your heart to spend time in the presence of God. You've made it a mission. You've made it a commitment. You've made it a, a priority. Then notice what he says in the next verse. No evil shall befall you. Can somebody just raise your hand and thank God for that right now? No evil will befall you. Nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. I'm here to tell you that there is a blessing that will be on your house when you prioritize the presence of God. Again, it's not arrogance, it's not me being better, but I'm, I live with the blessing of God. There are certain things that happen that I can't explain. It's the blessing of God. Listen, I mean, I don't want to be dramatic, but I mean, I think about and reflect on my life. There are no less than three times that my youngest son should be dead right now. Y'all are thinking, you really, no, I'm talking about when he was a toddler and we caught him at my in-law's house crawling out the doggy door and trying to get into the pool. I'm talking about when we first bought our house and... We thought he was with somebody else and come to find out he was standing in the middle of a highway. I know some of you are thinking, PB, you need to pray for parenting. I, I know, but I'm just being honest. Is this okay? I'm talking about times where he, even when he was at school, he like slipped into a cabinet and was eating some stuff he didn't need to be eating and they called me like panicking and that wasn't on me. You can't blame PB's parenting on that. My son is as healthy as he's ever been physically. Never had an adverse effect. Do I live in fear? I mean, I can't lie. There were times after those moments where I was just always had to have my hands on him, but I finally got to the point where the Lord said, you know what? <laughs> you dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. You dwell in the secret place. There's a blessing on your life. 
That's all I can explain it. I can't, and again, I know there's tragedies that happen. I can't explain, but I know that the Lord has, has given me comfort and said, yeah, even when maybe there was a mistake, a tragedy could have happened, my hand has been on you. And I'm sure if you looked at your life and you saw different things, there are probably areas and elements of your life when you look back and you can't even explain why they didn't go a different direction. But God, in His hand, in His mercy, oh gosh, His mercy, His mercy, even when it could have been bad and we messed up, His mercy kept His hand upon us. How many of you are thankful for that? I think of story after story. Go ahead. Praise the Lord. Listen, again, I don't... That's the only way I can explain it. I don't want you to take it any other way. I don't mean it any, you know, outside way. But there are times when there have been people, you know, we'd gone to family gatherings where everybody in that gathering had some kind of virus or COVID or flu or something. And we's all around them. And of course, afterwards, you know, we're just sitting there counting down. Guess what? We were able to... Nobody was sick. Again, does it mean that I'm special? No, it just means that the hand of God, no evil befalled me. No... I'm, I, I'm not telling you that you'll never have to deal with any other problems, and I'm not telling you we won't ever be sick in our household. I'm sitting here simply telling you that when I put my faith in the Lord, and I've made Him the Lord of my life, and I've proclaimed it with my mouth, and I get into His secret place, He's promised to take care of me, so I'm just going to thank Him for when He does that. Look at the next verse. This is why. It's nothing to do with me. <laughs> he says He will give His... Angels. One of my favorite stories. I mention it all the time. I'll mention it again. The prophet Elisha in the Old Testament. He's just sitting there chilling out. His servant starts freaking out because he went outside and saw the Syrian army. They's all surrounded him. And his servant was probably like what most of us do. <gasps> Elisha, man, they're all around us. They're coming. What are we going to do? <laughs> Elisha just chilling. He, had been, he was dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Y'all understand? He was saying that the Lord is my God. And so he just simply prayed a prayer and said, God, will you open his eyes and let him see? And so the servant goes out after a few times and with his eyes open, he sees that their armies were surrounded by like a, a, a whole swarm, a chariot of angel armies all the way around them. I'm telling you, if you, if the Lord could just open our spiritual eyes to see what He has engaged to protect us, a lot of this fear and anxiety and worry and depression that we allow to control our lives would be no more. It would be powerless. Is this okay? He has given angels charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. So I believe, you know, going back to what I said earlier, and some of you were judging my parenting skills, I believe when my son was young and would get out of people's and just slip around with the things that he dealt with, he didn't make it to the pool because there was an angel there the whole time. When he went out in the road, nothing hit him because there was an angel around him the whole time. I know, I mean, y'all may think I'm crazy, but I'm willing to think I'm crazy because I believe that the Lord is going to take care of me. I believe He has dispatched angels to, to, to look over me. And when the enemy tries to send His attacks and His fiery darts and His demons after me, God's angels are going to take care of me. Look at the next verse. In their hands, they shall bear you up. Man, I don't know about you, but as I said, I'm not any better than anybody. And there are times when in my life, I might slip up. I screw up. Anybody? Just me? That's fine. I don't get it. But if we're to be honest, there are times when we mess up. You may not believe it or not. There are times that I get angry. There are times when something happens that just... If you really were to get into my personality type, which we don't have to, but I'm, I'm one who really likes defined lanes. I like defined standards. I like for things to go as planned. Anybody like that? Okay. So all it takes is for one thing to go wrong away from the way that I had it planned. 
And I can start to get a little bit aggravated. Okay. And it almost works just like that. I'm like, what is going on? You know, I thought my wife was going to do this and realize she had a nail appointment. <laughs> they are like that. It's okay. I'm just being transparent. It's okay. The kids were supposed to do this and they didn't. And uh, Kids. You go to work and I had my day already planned. I knew what I was going to do for this hour, this hour, this hour. And I get there and all of a sudden an impromptu meeting. You don't know what I mean? We're supposed to do this and work on what the kids worked on or the students worked on in the last class and none of them did it? <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm just giving you some small examples. You come to church? Hey, never mind, I won't go there. But leave all that alone. Leave that all that alone. Hallelujah. Just kidding, just kidding. So there are times when because of my personality, because of life, y'all, y'all with me, because of the way life is, I can get aggravated and sometimes my emotions can get the best of me. And I don't know about you, you may just be able to pray all of it away right away, but there are times when emotions start to come up and, and without thinking, without praying, without listening to the Holy Spirit, forgetting the secret place, I just say the first thing that comes to my mind. Anybody ever done that before? Now, thankfully, listen, I'm sanctified. It's usually nothing that I would, you know, couldn't say in the pulpit, you know, legally, but it's usually something that might be hurtful or something that's <laughs> something that's sarcastic, something that's maybe insulting. Does this make sense? Again, I know none of you do that. And I'm thankful the Lord has pruned me so much that I've grown so much in that area. But but even if I have a day like that and I have lashed out at my wife or I've lashed out at my kids or God forbid I lash out at a coworker or a student just because they said the wrong thing at the wrong time. Y'all know what I mean? I'm thankful that the Word says that He has angels that can bear us up lest you dash your foot against the stone. That means there have been times where even if there's still moments where I may slip and say something, before I did something that really could do damage, I'm thankful that there's been times where the Holy Spirit has just intervened right in that moment and helped me. There have been moments where I feel like an angel helped and delivered the situation before it could have gotten worse. Anybody know what I mean? That one person just happened to walk up before I could say what I wanted to say and tell those people off. Anybody know what I mean? The phone rang just at the right time. That, that song came on the radio just at the right time. Now whatever it is that you may deal with, it may be the tip t- that, that time when you almost fell back into that moment, the angel swooped in and helped you make sure you didn't dash your foot against the stone. Amen? That situation where it could have been bad, that situation where you were almost in a bad predicament, that situation where temptation would have had a foothold, the angel came and the angel would lift you up. It's, they're powerful. Aren't you thankful that angels are surrounding you? Listen, you shall tread upon, the next verse 13, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, and you shall trample them under your feet. That's a twofold meaning. There's some literal meaning there. You have power over the animal kingdom. Does that make sense? Now, again, in case you're new, we're not crazy. We ain't about to, you know, bring some out to practice this, okay? Regardless of who you talk to, the snakes aren't hidden under the stage. We don't do any of that, okay? Just making sure you know that. So we're not about to get out here and, you know, entertain you with it. But I do believe there's some importance. Realize that God has created us and we're we're a special covenant people with Him. Amen? But I want you to also that these are symbolic of enemy spirits. These are symbolic of demonic spirits. The slithering snake demons and the, the lions and the things that the enemy has tried to unleash on this earth and unleash in your soul and try to unleash and come after you. I'm here to tell you that the Lord has given you dominion over those things. Listen, we're in a world, and I'm always careful to say it. I'll say it again. I believe where the Holy Spirit dwells, there's no room for an enemy spirit. So we need to walk of authority. Let's quit again with our mouth glorifying the demonic and quit glorifying. I'm not telling you that it's fake. I'm not telling you to, to ignore it, but I'm telling you to speak with power. You have dominion over it. Look at the next verse. Because He has set 
his love upon me. How many of you are thankful that we are loved? Let's just stop there. There's somebody in here, I feel this right now, that you, you struggle with feeling love. You kind of wonder if anybody loves you. You think that you've gone too far that God doesn't love you. Can I prophetically declare something to your soul right now? He loved you enough that He sent His own Son to die for you. He loved you so much that He'll never stop chasing after you. He loves you and He wants you to be a part of His kingdom because He has set His love upon us. Therefore, He says, I will deliver Him and set Him on high because He has known my name. The Lord wants to deliver you and help you simply because He loves you. Amen? He shall call upon me in verse 15 and I will... I think sometimes we read that and it just kind of becomes routine. It's almost like a cliche, if you can use that term. Cliche, things that have been said over and over again that they've almost loosed their thought. I will call and He will answer. Well, I mean, that makes sense, right? You think call, it's... Do you realize that you have a God in heaven, a God power, so powerful that He can speak one word and create the entire universe, boom, stars and planets and galaxies far beyond anything the human brain can comprehend. He can literally breathe and beings of dirt just start breathing and become humans. Do you all understand that, how powerful our God is? Have you ever thought about that? The God that not only created humans one time, but He has created and, and, and been the designer of humans ever since then. Billions upon billions upon billions. Even the fact that there's not even a number fathomable of how many people have been on the earth. Are you all with me? And yet that very same God, all He has to do is hear your single voice. And He's like, yes. All he has to hear is me say, God, I need you. And he says, Bradley, I am see you. If I call on him, he'll answer. I don't know about you, but there's nothing more powerless if you've ever been in a situation where you've needed somebody and you've tried to call and they didn't answer. You ever been broken down on the side of the road with poor phone signal or a wife with a dead phone or something and you're just like, I just need somebody to answer the phone. I can tell you, I've been in a few of those situations at least for a little bit, and it, there's nothing more <laughs> literally helpless. There's literally nothing you can do. And sometimes the enemy will try to, I shouldn't say sometimes, just about all the time, the enemy wants to convince you that that is how you are walking in this life. When you're facing the wiles of, of life, when you're facing the turmoils and the sicknesses and the illnesses and you're facing the struggles and all the turmoil, He wants you to think, go ahead, cry out, do all that you want to. There's nobody listening. I'm here to tell you that's a lie. The enemy knows it's a lie. He birthed it because there's a Father up in heaven who loves you and they'll hear every time you call. Amen. He says, you shall call upon me, I will answer I will be with him in trouble. Trouble. Even if the trouble is something that you have to endure. I told you before. Listen, all of these things I'm talking about, it's never a moment where life is all going to be candy like land and rainbows and just easiness, right? But guess what? Even when you do have to endure trouble, you're not going to have to endure it alone. I've used this analogy before, even at college. I teach college now. I kind of thought college students were independent. But no, even in college, I kind of chuckle, not to make fun, but just inside, internally. I'll notice when there's a student that has to ask a question after class. Again, these are young adults, college students. But I'll get tickled that sometimes one student has the question, but they make sure another one stays behind. Why? Because sometimes it just feels good to have just a little bit of moral support, to know that you're not alone, right? There's sometimes when they can leave after an assignment, and one of them will finish the assignment 20 minutes before the other, but they'll just wait behind. Why? Just, it just feels good to have somebody with I'm here to tell you that there's sometimes it's just a good idea. It, it just feels good to know that even if I'm going through struggle, I'm not having to go through it alone. He says, I will, lo, I will be with you even until the ends of the earth. 
I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and I will what? That's powerful. The Lord, if you will endure, will honor you. There's a reward awaiting for me. I believe that there's blessings and favor I'll see here on this earth. But please understand, there's again, as I said, ultimately a reward that's waiting for me. And even if I don't see anything that looks like a reward here on this earth in my physical, there's still a reward for all of the labor that I've done here on earth awaiting for me. Is this anybody understanding this? One day I'm going to get to go to heaven. One day there's, there's going to be a reward awaiting for me. So there's going to be honor. Amen? Look at the next verse. With long life, I will satisfy him. Let's pause there. How many of you are thankful for that? A long life, I will satisfy him. Now listen, I can't help when I even read this today. This comes to mind, so I think I might as well address it. Because I, I assume if I think about it, other people might too. Well, sometimes we read that and you're like, well, Pastor Brother, what about people who die young? Listen, I wish I could give you just, you know, the straight exact answer from the mind of God, but there's some of those things that He's hidden from me. But here's what I believe. If I dwell in the shadow of the Almighty, if I proclaim that He is my God, He's given me a life long enough to fulfill every bit of the destiny that He wants me to fulfill. If that ends tonight, If that ends in five years, ten years, if I've got 40 more years coming, everything I need to fulfill, everything that God has for me, He's promised that if I walk with Him, I've been promised that. Amen? I can have faith. I don't have to sit here and doubt and let the world of deconstruction and let the doubters and the people without faith say, oh, if God was really God, He wouldn't do that. No, God has a a definitive plan for me. He's got a destiny for me. And if I stay and do what I'm called to do and, and obey His Word, then every bit of that will come to pass. And know what He'll do? Show Him my... I'll live long enough to see everything that the Lord wants me to see and do. Is this okay? So again, I told you I didn't have anything just super profound. I didn't even have a bunch of points. We read through a song. I hope that was okay. Because I believe that... This is the pathway to you preparing for whatever's next in your life. I don't, I, every one of you in here, and I'm not just saying it as a pun on the name, but I mean, you know, the reason why we call it this place all seasons. Every single person sitting in every chair is in a different season of your life. Physically, spiritually, you're in a different. So as I said, some of you, the next season you're preparing for may be just the next spiritual step. You know, I've been giving my life to the Lord, but I know that there's more that the Lord wants me to do. Well, you need to begin preparing yourself for that. Well, I don't know what it is. Prepare anyway. There's some of you in here that maybe just in life you're in different seasons. You're... You're, you're at the point where you've lived and you've raised a family. You're kind of in a retirement season. You want to know what's left? Prepare for it. We as a church, we talk about it all the time. This is a year of harvest. Let's prepare ourselves for it. How do we prepare? By getting into the secret place of the Most High God and proclaiming with our mouth that He is our God and that He is our fortress. And when we do that, He'll begin to give us all the tools that we need. I don't know who in here will be the next that have to endure an illness, may have to endure a tragedy, may have to endure a family issue. And I mean, again, I hope no one has to, but again, the reality is, is all of us are going to face a struggle regardless if we keep living. But I'm going to dwell in the secret place of the Most High and He's going to fill me up. And He's already promised that He would be my fortress and my deliverer and whatever I may face soon to come, He's going to lead me through it. Amen? Here's what I want to ask you to do, a little different, if you'll stand with me. We have just a little bit of time. I would ask everybody that will, that would be willing to, to come meet me down here in the altar. Will you do that? I promise we're not going to do anything weird. I'm not going to run around and push anybody or anything crazy like that. I just want us to spend some time in prayer together as a church. As I said, this psalm is one of my favorite, and not only do I read it a lot, but This is a psalm I prayed. 
You may think, what do you mean pray? I, a lot of times when I'm in prayer and I'm needing to talk to God, sometimes I just go verse by verse and let it guide me as I converse with God. So again, different. I know this isn't what we're used to. And that's okay, Pastor. We'll be back next week. But is it okay if we just spend some time praying together? And, and as I kind of guide you, can we pray through this psalm a little bit tonight? I just ask you to get into a place of prayer. If you want to bow, you can bow. If you want to kneel, you want to lay on your face. If you just want to hold hands or bow your head, whatever you feel the Lord doing. But I want us to spend some time going to prayer. Let's begin by going into His secret place. Will you begin to open your mouth and begin to proclaim how good He is? Father God, tonight, Father, we enter into Your secret place right now. Father, we enter into Your presence We once again, Father, proclaim your glory. We once again proclaim your goodness. We once again proclaim your power and your presence. Father, let us meet with you. Let us talk with you. Let us convene with you. Father, there's no one like you here on all the earth. Father, as the psalm says, we're going to declare and we're going to say, God, that you are our refuge. Will you begin to do that? Father, you are refuge. Father, our refuge is not in our bank account. It's not in our gifts. It's not in our talents. Father, it's not in our families. It's not in our relationships. Father, you and you alone are our refuge. So, Father, we put all of our faith in you. We put all of our honor in you. You are our fortress. Father, we trust you. No matter what we're facing. Father, there are people in this place that may be facing dire circumstances. Father, it doesn't look like in the flesh that it's going to go well. But Father, we trust you, God. Come on, proclaim your trust in Him. Begin to open your mouth and proclaim your trust in Jesus today. Father. Father, as we do this, I pray, Lord, that you would rest, your, rest us under your wings. Rest us under your wings. Protect us, Father. Give us protection, Jesus. Father, your word says that we will not be afraid of the terror by night. So, Father, right now, anybody in this place, God, that may be dealing with anxiety, anybody in this place that may be dealing with worry, anybody who the enemy has been trying to torture at night, we rebuke it now in the name of Jesus and we cast it off. We proclaim it gone. I proclaim peace in this place in Jesus' name. Peace in the mind. Father, you said in your word that once we proclaim who you are, that we will not have to fear the perilous pestilence. Father, I proclaim that you will continue to touch our minds. Give us clarity, God. Give us discernment. I pray for a spirit of discernment upon the minds of your people. Let us not be tricked by the wiles of the enemy. Let us not be fooled, God, by wolves who are in sheep's clothing, God. But let us hear the truth and know the truth and follow the truth. Father, no matter what we may see, a thousand may fall at one side, but Father, you promise, God, that nothing will befall us. So Father, let us not look to the left or the right. Let us not fear by what's going on around us. Father, the voice of the enemy in this world wants to bring calamity and danger and terror. But Father, we're not going to listen to that and allow that to rule our voice. Father, today, ground us in your word with trust that we're going to be okay. Hallelujah. Father, you say only, the word says, only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Father, I come against any voice of the enemy that tries to trick your people. Anyone in this place, God, that may have been dealing with a temptation, God, to back away, to back away from obligation, to back away from a calling, to back away from a higher level based on what culture may say or based on what comfort may say. Father, we come against that spirit in the name of Jesus. Father, we're in a spirit in a time of urgency. Whatever it is you have called us to do and you have ordered us to do, Father, give us the faith and the commitment and the strength and the diligence to see it out and to walk it out in Jesus' name. Father, we praise you and thank you that no evil will befall us. I again rebuke every spirit or word of fear that has been spoken in the minds of your people. Every grip of the enemy that has tried to fear cause a fear of loss or a fear of failure 
or a fear of not being good enough, we come against it now in the name of Jesus. Come on, proclaim that in this place. Fear, you can't have a hold. Faith arise in your people. Father, you said you would give your angels charge over us. So Father, we dispatch them in this place for each and every person that's here. Wherever they go on this earth, wherever they go from this place, in their homes, God, in their jobs, in the communities, doing what you've called them to do. Father, we pray for angels to be dispatched on the left and the right, following each one of us, going before us and going behind us, protecting us and keeping us. Father, we thank you that you've promised that you would answer when we call. So Father, help us to be diligent in our call. Let us not neglect our time to reach out to you, but let us make this a habit, God. Father, I pray you promised that you would give us long life. So Father, I pray that you satisfy that. Father, give us the life. Let us see all of the things that you would have us to see. Let us see your good here in the land of the living. Let us see your promises fulfilled in, your, in our lives. Father, we won't fear God, not being able to see things, but Father, we'll walk in confidence knowing, God, what you have promised us. We thank you for that.